the executive director of Historic Hawaii Foundation. And thank you all for coming out to the, the first class of our Greening Your Heritage Home series. So I think many of you are familiar with us, but Historic Hawaii Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Um, we work statewide to help people save historic places. I know many of you are members of Historic Hawaii Foundation. Thank you so much for all your support. It is because of our members and, and all of our supporters that we've been around for 44 years, if you can believe that. Um, so our mission is to help preserve the, the places that tell Hawaii's stories. We have many sponsors that have made tonight's series possible. Um, I'd like to recognize some of them. So um, AIA Honolulu, which is um, hosting us here in the beautiful Center for Architecture. Um, Architects Hawaii has donated for scholarships, so some people who might not otherwise have been able to come are able to join us. And then all of our presenters. We have Alan Shintani, Inc., the Association for Preservation Technology, Hawaii Energy, HHF Planners. Um, Historic Preservation Education Foundation is a nonprofit located on the mainland that is working with us on, a, they call it the Partners in Training Program. So a lot of um, thanks to them for helping to underwrite the series. Um, Pono Home, Mason Architects, and Roth Ecological have all been um, presenters, and you'll be hearing th from them, not tonight, but throughout the series. Um, so um, please join me in thanking all of our sponsors making this possible. I know we have some architects here. Um, through AIA Honolulu, this class is certified for continuing education credits. So if you are an architect and would like to get um, continuing education for it, just be sure to sign on to the CE form and um, with your license number, and we'll be turning that in. The <coughs> provider is AIA Honolulu. So here's what we're doing today. Um, we have 90 minutes together, and um, we have a lot of information, so we um, hope it will keep you engaged and, and thinking about it, but we are going to hold questions till the end. So if you do have questions, you know, note them and then we'll come back at the end. So right now I'm doing our welcome and overview. Um, and then we'll be turning it over to Andrea Nandoskar, who is Historic Hawaii Foundation's Education Program Manager. Um, she is stepping in for U.S. Green Building Council, who, who was unable to participate tonight. So if you're expecting someone else, um, surprise, we have Andrea, who is um, just as qualified and is going to do a wonderful job explaining the principles of sustainability. Um, following Andrea, I'm going to come back and talk about how to assess and think about historic buildings. And then we have a wonderful case study that's going to start to apply some of the principles we're going to talk about and talk about how it's working in practice. So Ed Chung, who is a um, historic homeowner in Manoa, and his wife Pat are going to be talking to us throughout the evening about some examples from their home. And um, then I'm going to come back and we'll start talking about the standards and guidelines for how to uh, look at historic properties as well as how to bring sustainability into historic preservation. And then we'll wrap up with discussion at the end. So the goals of these series really is to bring together the principles of preserving historic properties with the principles of sustaining our environment. And um, someone told me the other day that Preservation is the original sustainability. Um, it really comes down to not wasting things. So whether it's not wasting our natural resources, not wasting our cultural resources, or not wasting our historic resources, it really is about um, enjoying and taking care of what we have. So I think these two principles come together beautifully. So looking at ways that we can both preserve Hawaii's history and its historic places and do it in a way that is ecologically friendly and environmentally sustainable. So we're going to be giving an overview in this class and then diving more deeply in some of the follow-ups. Um, one thing to just be aware of, we are focused on um, how to look at properties, and especially residential properties, especially homes. And so this isn't going to answer all questions for any situation you may ever have. This is really about a way of thinking and a methodology. And as part of that, um, one of the handouts you have is a template for developing a maintenance plan. And we, we thought this was really helpful just as a takeaway and something that you can use to apply to your own property. Because again, every place is different. And you're going to learn about how to evaluate, learn about some of the things to look at, but it, 
to really apply that to your own place is something you'll need to do on your own or with some, pro some professional help in some cases. So that maintenance plan in your handout talks about some green tips, uh, it has a wonderful checklist on how to conduct an inspection and things to look at, and then a template that you can apply to a particular place. And then finally, there's some references and some additional materials for further reading or, or reference documents. So with that, um, I would like to invite Andrea up, and she's going to give us the overview on, on sustainability. I'm going to start off just by giving you a little bit of a step back to think about sustainability. I know that word has been around for a long time. But I, in thinking about this presentation tonight, I was thinking about the Malama Hunua voyage and care for our, oh sure, and care for our island earth and what that means exactly, and that is really a Hawaiian term that many of you are familiar with, which means to care for the water, the land, our communities, our culture, kind of the larger, larger picture. And so part of this sustainability series is about thinking about our connection to the larger picture. We're here individually in these homes, in this island, on this island rather, but what's our connection to the bigger picture? And how, do what, how does what we do, whether we're aware of it or not, impact? It, it does make a difference, as Jane Goodall said. Everything we do does make a difference, but what kind of difference do we want to make? And so another piece that came to me in the, in the course of looking into this was really interesting. It was the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them. And interestingly, having a green home fulfills nine of them if you are really being conscious and and fulfilling some of those properties. And so you can see some of them lift, listed up there. Um, and that brings us back to doing Malama Aina here for the land, caring for the land as we all want to do. And so being a good green homeowner as well as preserving your historic home, which is very sustainable, um, helps us do that. And just to reiterate what Kirsten was saying that um, sustainability is like it's the first green, so I love this quote. It, the greenest building really is the one that already exists. So we're gonna talk a little in this series about why um, preserving historic homes is green and sustainable, and we'll be sharing methods and practices with you that you can take back with you so that you can actually implement. And we'll be showing you examples. This is a really great first class because we're lucky to have Pat and Eddie Chung here, as Kirsten mentioned, to share actual examples and to inspire you, hopefully. So just some facts, I won't read them all, but basically embodied energy is, it took resources to extract um, materials from the earth to build something. And once you build it, you've used materials, you've used energy, both people and earth energy, and now you're using energy to heat it and to do other things, cool it, and so, you've already got that into a building that exists, and so it, it's embodying energy. I like to think of it, it's a little different, but it's kind of like a, a forest. When you have all that energy that created those trees and then you cut them down, you know what happens, the CO2 is released. And so it's, it's similar in the sense if you demolish what you have, you're releasing the energy that has been stored that's already been taken from Mother Earth. So what we would also like to help you do is we'd like to help you think of this as a process. So it's great to have an idea to do something like this, but what, how exactly do you approach it? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to understand what you have. What, what makes your home special? What kind of character-defining features or special um, architectural design do you have? What about the site? All of the different elements that make up your particular home make it special. So you, know, you have to take stock of what you've got. And then you want to, based on what you've taken stock of, you want to come up with a plan. Now some of the plan might be the really easy stuff, the low-hanging fruit that you can just immediately do yourself. But there might be other things that you have to kind of put on a timeline to think about, well, this is going to take longer, and it requires more money, and I might have to hire someone. And then the third part is, just set a date and get yourself going, and if you need to hire somebody, you can do that. The things you can do yourself, do by yourself. And so this is one of the models um, for those, many of you or 
I'm not sure, but hopefully some of you are familiar with LEAD, which is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which is one of the systems that you can use. It's a certification process. Now, you don't have to use this one, but um, the reason I'm sharing it is because it gives you kind of an overview of some of the areas that we'll be covering in this series. So we'll be looking at water efficiency next class, and then the energy, you'll be looking and thinking about how you look at, you know, how you um, address the site where your house is, the landscaping, um, even indoor environmental quality, which we'll get into a little bit deeper in a few minutes. And one of the things to think about, and we've all been here, I believe most of you are from Oahu. I don't know if you've seen all the flash flood. We've had just, I mean, it seems like the climate's changing really quickly. And so something really good to do, and I've even thought it might be fun to do like a water journal, is to take a look at your home and monitor what's going on when it rains. You may have some stormwater issues, and Pat and Eddie might mention something about what they did to address that on their site, which they shared with us on a visit. But it's really important to kind of take a look at water on your site. What, where is it going when it rains? What issues are you having, if any, that may be able to be addressed? And also, what you know, is water being wasted? Um, can you harvest some of that water? You can just kind of think about all of those things. And just like journaling in other areas of life can be helpful, I think monitoring what's going on in a journal when you, when you have successive storms or whatever can kind of help you identify a pattern. And I think the other piece, I the other point I wanted to make on this was, and, and I think this is very much true of this whole series, is to think of it holistically. So it's not isolated elements, though you may address it that way when you actually implement and, and have plans to, to take action. But it's really a holistic way to look at your whole entire property, just like your body. It's like you've got your internal organs, you have your skin, you have you know, your hair, things on the outside. And it's a whole system. And how can you make a healthy whole system? Now, there is a statistic on the first line of this slide that blew my mind. Um, it's basically saying that the, each year, Americans are taking 3.7 trillion gallons of water, more, more water than we're putting back into the natural aquifer and other water systems. And I, feel, I felt really sad when I read that. And I thought, well, this is great that we're doing this class. It's a, you know, everybody can do their part. And just learning about our water systems, learning about efficiency, which we'll be talking about in, in the next classes, how we can cut down on water use inside our home and also outside, um, we can do our small part to reduce that. And we can also save money in the process. And we can feel good that we are not needing to use all of that water. Maybe we just didn't know there were ways to, to avoid that. And I love this picture. It's, it's a really, I hope you can see it. Um, it's in your handouts as well. And it's just, it's just a really great illustration, an overview of things that you can do on your site, um, be it with water catchment and reusing gray water, uh, planting native plants, planting plants that are drought resistant that you don't have to water as much having drip irrigation as opposed to having, you know, lots of the, you know, sprinkler systems and other things tend to, a lot of water evaporates. And so just learning about um, and seeing what makes sense for where you are, for your particular home and your site. But it's fun. This is also really fun. I love these calculators. So this is also in your booklet. And for those attending the series, you've got it. Oh, I think everybody got the additional resources. So you can go, this is the first of, I think, three different uh, calculators. If you go, there's, it's, it doesn't take very long at all to do it. I, I think I did a couple times last night. It was really fun. And the great thing about these, these um, calculators is not that they're like pure science and you're going to know exactly what to do. But I, I look at it as more a consciousness. It's more an awakening of realizing like, wow, I really, you know, I don't have low, um, I forgot what the word is, uh, for my shower heads. Like I could I have a drip in my kitchen, and it's really adding up to that much water every day. And just kind of making you more aware. And also, it may surprise you. And that will also be an impetus to try to change things. So this is really interesting, too. Um, I remember when I first learned that buildings actually use 
more energy than a lot of other sectors. And I, I kind of find that hard to believe at first till I started to think about what it, what's involved in a building. And even in a residential property, there's a lot of energy there. So just in general, broadly, almost half of the energy use in the United States and 70, almost 75 or 3 quarters of the uh, electricity in the US is produced um, it's, it's buildings. Buildings consume all of that. And residential, actually, um, residential buildings are responsible for a quarter of the US total of CO2 emissions. And all buildings representing just under half of all CO2 emissions. And so again, it's, it's like all these different points are coming back to say, hey, a little bit of consciousness, a little effort, um, and a lot of fun, you can create some, some really good mitigation of you know, waste of energy and be good stewards. And especially we're very much aware of that here, being an island nation far away from everything where we have to import, what is it, Scott might know, like 90% of our oil or whatever. And this is another diagram which is similar, except this is comparing the use of energy, the consumption of energy and CO2 compared to other sectors being the transportation sector and industry. So again, we can see that buildings are huge. Now, residential buildings are a part of that. That's not entirely um, indicative of just residences. But residences, are, there's a lot of residences in the world, so we can make a difference. And this is a fun energy pyramid. Um, it's, there's a little company out in the middle of Pennsylvania where somebody's working hard to educate people about energy use. And so this um, gentleman who's the owner of that company created this. And what I love about this is we hear and talk so much about solar and wind and geothermal and biodiesel. And those are all excellent and really important. But they're not the only piece of the equation, as you can see. Um, conservation is huge. Conserving things, in fact, one of our speakers for the energy, um, the energy class, which is class three, is someone from Hawaii Energy, which is contracted by the state to reduce, through conservation and energy efficiency, the use of energy in the state. So that's a really overlooked and really important, and, and probably one of the low-hanging fruits that you might address. And then you've got efficiency as well, which um, energy efficient appliances and lighting and other things. And we'll be addressing these in class three on energy, um, in class two on water, two, and also in um, class five, or I think, okay. And here's another one of those fun footprints, and this is an EPA one, and this is actually your carbon footprint. You've probably heard that as Earth Day is approaching, everyone's talking about, like, what's my carbon footprint? You can go and find out. For materials and resources, we often if we have opportunities, especially using things that are local, being an island chain, an island community, um, finding that there's lots of materials that might have been generated by you know, various means if something needed to be torn down or there was just an opportunity for um, reclaiming some of these things. And there's a place, um, Reuse Hawaii is part of your resources, but there's lots of other ways, and Eddie will explain some really creative things that, as a homeowner, he did to kind of take things that would have ended up in the dump and find a really beautiful use for them, an aesthetic one as well. So that's, that's thinking about materials and resources in a new way, not as something that we necessarily have to be virgin resources, but what can we find around our neighborhood that might be reusable and integrated into our landscape or our home? And this is an example of that. And one thing I'd like to bring up, which a lot of the costs, you know, when we talk about the costs of things in our world, we often don't um, allow for externalities. So the, the amount of energy it took to extract something, the amount of resources, transportation, fuel, all of these different things which are noted here, a pollution that was caused by this extraction, both air, water, and land, these are often externalities. They're not, they're kind of hidden and we don't address them. So I invite you to think about resources as true costs. What is the true cost of something? Spend some time if you're gonna go buy some hard wood somewhere and go back and trace it and find out where was this, where did this come from? Who cut it down? How was it transported? When was it planted? And if you look at that whole cycle, 
it's quite enlightening and, it's, and it makes us better stewards and it makes us more likely to think about what we buy and where we buy it. And finally, I'd like to talk just really briefly about indoor health. So we may or may not be aware, but and, and maybe a little bit less so in Hawaii because many of us have windows that, we, that stay open, so it's a little bit less confining than on the mainland where we're all cooped up with pesticides and dander and uh, dust mites. But, but indoor, I mean, your health does depend upon what's inside your home. Um, having the opportunity to kind of assess what kind of chemicals you have in your house, some things are really benign, some are mildly toxic, and some are quite... I mean, if you get sick after cleaning your oven, you might want to rethink what you're cleaning your oven with. Just something to think about. You know, it's also going into the water supply after you use it, and that's polluting waterways. So these are just things to think about when you think about your health. And that's just a little illustrated example for all us visual learners, too, to kind of take a look at all of the different potential areas where there might be some indoor pollution. And there's a way to mitigate that. There's a way to stop it at the source. And sometimes if you have to use it, you can dilute it or find ways to make it less um, intense or potent. 